I never thought that we would experience anything like this in Rochester. Rochester's steady eddy real estate market appears to be no more. Home values are still on the rise and inventory is still way down. The last house that we put an offer in on, there were 22 offers. It is discouraging news for buyers. The typical real estate season getting underway is as competitive, if not more, than in the previous two years. Good afternoon. I'm Doug Emblitz. And I'm Jenny Ryan. Really, two sets of numbers tell the story. Five years ago, there were 2,200 area homes listed for sale. This year, there are 262 listings, a 90% drop in inventory. And that's making for some fierce competition. Emily and Mark Cohen said, I do, in October, and then took another leap into Rochester's frenzied real estate market. Tough. It's really tough. And I'm smiling now because I feel like if I don't smile, I'll cry. <laughs> They've clearly taken care of this place. It's old. The Cohens last week found the perfect house and put it in offer, $96,000 over the asking price. There were 21 other offers. The house sold for 120000 more than the asking price. We think we're offering some ridiculous sum, and we come to learn that not only did we lose out by 50 or 60 grand, uh, but that the person had a no-cap offer. So they're like, yep, we'll beat anybody out. I've been doing this for 30-some years. I I've never seen anything like this. Realtor Mark Seawick believed the housing market was going to cool off. That was two years ago. He says the lack of inventory, down 90% since 2017, makes it unlikely the market will return to what we used to know. About two years ago, we were very, very careful, telling our clients over and over again, do not pay that amount of money. Uh, this is unsustainable. Well, it turns out that this actually isn't, uh, there's not going to be a correction. What's in, instead playing out is that we're at a new high water mark. Seawick says he's urging clients who find the right house and can't afford it to move on it now and build equity. Local home values that in the past increased 3 to 5% a year soared 18% last year. If you're a first-time home buyer and you're forced into the position of having to uh, pay over, it's probably best to do that now because there is no let up that we see going on in the foreseeable future. They've updated it so much. I mean, the Mark and his wife Emily are still in the hunt, hopeful about a house they'll see Monday that has yet to be listed. Maybe, just maybe, they can avoid the dreaded bidding war. Now, buyers aren't only paying more, many are foregoing inspections, and some are even willing to let the homeowners live rent free. After the closing, Seawick says if his client is interested in buying a home, we will often schedule a second showing where they can do an unofficial inspection of the home to see if there is anything wrong. Also today, former Rochester City Councilman Adam McFadden was sentenced to 18 months in federal prison. McFadden pleaded guilty to stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from local charities. He apologized to the community in court today. And 13 WAMS' Natalie Kuchko reports McFadden says he continues to accept responsibility for his actions. Natalie? Before a federal judge, McFadden accepted his sen sentence today for pocketing thousands from community charities, including an organization he led for nearly 15 years to cover his own debts. Former city councilman Adam McFadden will spend 18 months behind bars and pay back hundreds of thousands for bilking agencies that help people in need, including children. Today is uh, the end of one chapter and the start of another one. I want to uh, basically say that I'm uh, deeply and truly sorry to the community that I've disappointed and hurt. McFadden was arrested in February 2019 in connection with a fraud and money laundering investigation related to the Rochester Housing Authority. He pleaded guilty in 2019 to wire fraud. He was found guilty of submitting fraudulent invoices and receipts so he could be reimbursed for $130,000 from Quad A for Kids, an after-school program for City Youth where he served as executive director. I want to say to everyone, it's very important that we follow the law it's very important that we uphold the law, and today I'm paying the price for not doing that. McFadden must pay back roughly 265000 to Quad A for Kids, the IRS, and Rochester Housing Charities. 
In court, McFadden called his actions a behavioral issue, one he says he's been working through in counseling. His attorney, Joe D'Amelio, says he's remorseful. The good part of him is still there. His commitment to his community is still there. Uh, certainly he asks his community for forgiveness. Uh, and he can still, he, and he will continue to, to volunteer and advocate for people uh, who are who's not as uh, fortunate as others in the community. McFadden echoes that commitment once his sentence is complete. I'm okay with it. I accepted my responsibly, responsibility three years ago. So I'm not running from this. I'm not hiding from this. This is my community that I love, and I'm not going anywhere. Now, the Federal Bureau of Prisons will assign McFadden to a facility in the near future. McFadden's attorney requested he be placed in one closer to Rochester. The pandemic has forced a lot of people to rethink their profession. Recent data show a record number of teachers across the country are leaving their jobs for something else. But as Dan Track explains in this week's Crisis in the Classroom report, the pandemic is also offering some perspective. D Doug, we've all been to that breaking point. You know, you throw your hands in the air, you say, I can only do so much. For some people, that's called burnout. And for others, well, it's just time to reassess. For nearly a decade, Paige Labar has been at the head of the classroom, educating young minds, grading papers, and developing lesson plans to keep her students on track. Teaching in general is a career where you have to set your own boundaries and decide you know, this is a job that can be 20 hours a day, seven days a week if you let that happen, and that's not sustainable. For students, the school day starts and ends at the sound of the bell. But for teachers, the work lasts much longer. It never ends. Um, to say it's a 10-month job is not accurate. Brian Eberts, president of the Teachers Association in Greece, says pandemic changes piled onto educators' already hefty workloads is causing teachers to burn out. The expectation that teachers can constantly on the fly provide high-quality education with students in class, home, short-term, long-term, it's just it's incredibly challenging, to say the least. According to the National Education Association, teachers are leaving the field in record numbers. It's a trend that began before the pandemic, but has only gotten worse over the past two and a half years. Labar sees similarities between recent years and her first years on the job, from learning how to manage a full schedule to getting rid of ineffective practices. I feel like that cycle kind of happened over again in the last couple of years where we made so many changes so quickly in education that there was a lot of what felt like first year survival mode and then cycling back to time to reflect with, OK, what am I doing that's really working and what am I doing that maybe is a waste of my time? Regardless of the downfalls, Labar says she's hopeful. Others can learn from this trying time. So I think that there will be some good things that come out of this. Using technology as a tool to, to advance learning, not just to put it into a classroom because it's bright and shiny, but to really change the role of a teacher to facilitate awesome things in the classroom. Both Labar and Eberts recommend teachers who are struggling reach out to their colleagues, if for nothing more than emotional support. Labar also recommended some literature that she has found helpful. We've posted that on our website with this story, 13wham.com.